A lot of people, they look for a quick fix to things, right? So they go, I want to know which whiskey pairs with this cigar or which wine will pair with this cigar. So rather than dictating to others, this is what you should drink with this cigar, what we do is encourage a way of thinking or a philosophy that will help people tease out those whiskies that are going to help them enhance their cigar yeah. rather than fight with it. Yeah. In this case, we're actually starting with the oldest whiskey, which is 18 years old. So it's going to have flavors that you wouldn't find in a younger whiskey. So let's have a little taste. Well, it's time for our next whiskey. Yes. So let's move on to the Springbank. So Springbank is an incredible distillery. I mean, it, it is both a working distillery. Um, it is a very integral part of the Campbelltown community, which is a small uh, fishing town um, on the, the very southernmost tip of the Kintyre Peninsula on the west coast of Scotland. It... Um, has been in the same family since its founding, the Mitchell family. And uh, I think there's a, there's a running theme in Scotch whiskey that when distilleries are owned by families, um, they tend to take a longer view on where they want to take their distillery and the legacy they want to leave for the generations that come next. One of the first things I was ever told by a, a, a senior marketing executive back when I first joined the industry a long time ago was that um, the biggest mistake someone can ever make when they work in a whiskey company is to think of whiskey as a FMCG fast moving consumer good. He says, no, it's not. This is a, this is a long term investment. You can't make change production parameters or make decisions about the casks you're filling with this view of sort of satisfying the shareholders or nimbly adjusting to, to meet a new ch a change in market demand. And unfortunately, sometimes uh, companies that are owned by con conglomerates when they've got shareholders to serve, they can sometimes, sometimes often they make the right decisions, but sometimes they don't. And, um, and sometimes the, the changes that are made at distilleries are made with the best of intentions. So during the 20th century, but particularly in the post-war period, there was this feeling that um, practices at distilleries had to change. So there were some of these things were very good. So hygiene uh, during the brewing process improved significantly. Um, many distilleries moved away from direct firing, which is something we'll talk about later, which is where you uh, actually have a fire underneath the copper pot still, and many of them moved to steam heating at this time, although that had actually been going on since the Victorian period. Um, and then one of the other big changes that happened is the, uh, the, the malt, the, the malted barley that's used to make single malt previously had really been made at the distilleries. I mean, sometimes they would, there would be maltsters nearby, but these were small scale malting operations where the, the barley would come from the farmers, it would be steeped, it would be laid out on floors, allowed to germinate, uh, and that's what unlocks the barley and allows you to make whiskey out of it. And, and up until that point, that often happened at distilleries on what's called f a process called floor malting, where they would lay the barley out on the floor. Now, in the mid 20th century, as the industry began to sort of professionalize, many distillers moved away from that and big commercial maltsters began producing malt en masse for multiple distilleries. Springbank um, was part of that and, and they did at one point uh, move to using commercially malted barley but actually even though Springbank had been part of that shift and had begun to uh, use commercially malted barley uh, during the 20th century like many other distilleries in 1992 the then owner of Springbank Mr Headley Wright who was uh, descended from the original uh, the original family that that, uh, that founded Springbank he took the decision to reopen floor maltings at Springbank and this is an incredibly significant decision i mean the costs must have gone through the roof right so commercially malted barley there's economy of economies of scale and this is your raw material right so you a lot many companies would choose to go with whatever the cheapest option is he said no i want to bring back the traditional process back to uh, my distillery or back to his distillery and and really make 
at the time, then Scotland's only 100% production on one site distillery. So everything from barley coming from farmers mm -hmm. through to the bottling. Now, that was a significant decision also because, and this is something we're actually, even though we'd had anecdotal evidence for decades, we're only really now seeing the research coming out on it. We're finding that actually floor malted barley creates whiskey that tastes different to commercially malted barley. Mm. It's to do, I won't go into the science of it, but it's to do with the fact that floor malting is quite a slow process. Commercial malting is done as quickly as possible to get as much malted barley out of the door as possible. So what we had here was the final piece of a puzzle uh, added to a distillery that already had not gone through many of the changes that had happened during the 20th century. So Springbank, its wash still, which is the first still that's used during the double distillation process, is still directly fired. That means there is a gas flame on the bottom mm -hmm. of the still. That um, leads to something called a Maillard reaction, which is a bit like when you're searing a steak, that sort of caramelization process. Uh, it's quite similar to that. Um, and that now we're understanding creates flavors that we otherwise wouldn't have had in the whiskey. So we have here pretty much the most traditional old-fashioned distillery in Scotland. I mean, it has a, certainly a much lighter nose, a little bit more floral. I completely agree. And whereas this perhaps had sort of red apple and marmalade and dried fruit, I would get here on the nose almost sort of more delicate sort of white fruits, like um, there's perhaps some peach in there or apricot. There's... Um, there's a, actually an interesting sort of creaminess, um, sort of the smell, like a slightly lactic, um, maybe a slightly yogurt-like smell. And, uh, and I would say green apple rather than the red apple yeah. we were talking about before. Absolutely. It's also significantly less fuller, full-bodied. I mean, this is very full-flavored. This is much lighter on the palate, doesn't linger as long, has a cleaner finish, I'd say. I, I completely agree. And what's interesting, this actually includes barley that has uh, been smoked with peat. So they have a, a, a sort of light to medium peating level uh, for this whiskey, but it's not a heavy smoke, yeah. right? You're not getting, it doesn't taste like mm -hmm. you've bitten into a bit of charred meat or anything. It's just a very subtle, very subtle smokiness. So this is allowing me to experience more of the flavor profile of the Trinidad than I would say the, uh, the first one. And it, I'd say, almost softens and rounds out the, um, the blend even more. I mean, a medium, you know, bodied cigar, I'd say, is even slightly more creamier and a little bit more on the center front of my palate. I'd agree. And it's interesting that we've moved from a very full-bodied whiskey to still a re you know, relatively full, but it's not, no, not light-bodied by any means. But yeah, I agree with you. It's sort of sitting in that medium profile, which maybe is why it goes so well with this cigar. So you've done the taste and then the puff and you liked it. So let's now try the puff and then the taste. Definitely getting different flavors now, right? A little bit more sweetness and green apple. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I'm, I'm actually um, detecting a, a slight nuttiness. That I'm, I'm, it's interestingly, I'm not sure. When we first tasted the, the whiskey on its own, I wasn't getting any nuttiness, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't have described this as a nutty cigar. But I actually, having done it this way, I, I, I'm getting this very delicate sort of blanched almond yeah. um, nuttiness on it, which is absolutely delicious. And it's, it's on the finish too, mm -hmm. right? It's where I'm kind of detecting yeah. that. I completely agree. And I think um, it, what's also interesting is that the Tamdu, I actually think personally, for my taste, benefited from just a little drop of water in it. Yeah. Whereas this one, I think I probably won't add any mm. water to this one. I think this is bottled at the perfect strength yeah. for, for pairing with the cigar. Hmm. May I take a little bit more? You may. So I'll tell you a little bit, <laughs> a little bit more about Springbank. Um, I have mentioned earlier that this is arguably the most sought after whiskey in the world right now. Um, perhaps Yamazaki in Japan could uh, could rival it in terms of the, the hype around it. 
Um, and what, what I love about this is that this phenomena, uh, which maybe could be compared for people who drink American whiskey to perhaps the, the Pappy Van Winkle oh. obs and the Weller obsessions that are happening right it's now. True cult following. Exactly, real cult following. What's wonderful about this is that this isn't coming from a conglomerate with you know millions of pounds worth of marketing budget. I, I don't think Springbank has ever done any marketing, really. Maybe they've done a little bit in it throughout its history, but I don't think I've ever seen an advert for Springbank. This has purely come through enthusiasts and falling in love with the traditional production process at this distillery and the culture at the distillery and in the and, and the, the place, Campbelltown, for Many years, um, sort of over a century ago, we went back to a time when Campbelltown was actually described as whiskeyopolis by people. <laughs> there were uh, over 30 distilleries active in Campbelltown at one point. Uh, it, was a, it was a true whiskey capital in the way that maybe Speyside is today. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was for a couple of reasons. It was partly to do with being able to export to Ireland from, from Campbelltown. Um, it was also very readily able to uh, reach by water Glasgow. Uh, which was a, a real trading centre uh, for not just the United Kingdom, but throughout, at the time, the, the British Empire. So Campbelltown was incredibly important to the history of Scotch whisky. So though the number of distilleries in Campbelltown had declined by the beginning of the 20th century, this was the place that was uh, chosen by Masataka Takatsuru, the father of Japanese whiskey, mm. when he was sent from Japan to Scotland to learn about the production of malt whiskey. He traveled around the country and visited a few different distilleries, mm. but he did his placement yeah. at Hazelburn Distillery yeah. in Campbelltown. So that's how significant this small, uh, you know, small fishing town was to the Scotch whiskey industry, that this was seen as the place to go to learn about whiskey production at that time. And how many distilleries are left now? Is it Sadly, that number declined uh, to only two. Uh, so there was Springbank and then there was, uh, the remains, Glen Scotia. Um, Springbank, the company that owns it, actually did open another distillery, uh, which is called Glengyle, which is the sort of sister distillery to Springbank. And at the moment, there are a number of active planning applications to start a, a number of other distilleries there. So we might be uh, not perhaps going back to Whiskeyopolis, but we're certainly going to be having a very high proportion of distilleries in one place, considering the population is very small. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, it's interesting how, you know, you, you see kind of the ebb and flow of history you know, manifested or inflected through, you know, the Scotch whiskey industry. Uh, like the family running uh, Springbank, being able to hold on to that tradition uh, and to really keep it in its purity, right? And I think for those that appreciate craft, there's a certain uh, romance that I think is, you know, best articulated in bespoke shoe making through someone like John Lobb or in bespoke uh, suit making with like Henry Poole uh, and some of the other firms that you find on Savile Row. And it's very rare, you know, for a firm that's 150 years old or older to be able to remain in one family. I mean, you think about family dynamics uh, multi-generationally, you know, to be able to preserve that uh, is really a remarkable feat in and of itself. Exactly. I completely agree. And I think actually one of the things that has allowed the family to maintain Springbank is the fact that it has been integrated with the community of Campbelltown. Mm -hmm. So there's a joke that when you go to Campbelltown, sort of, you can ask, stop anyone in the street and ask them if they're from Campbelltown. And if they say yes, you say, have you worked at any point for this company? And almost always they will say yes. So this was, you know, through very difficult times for Campbelltown, um, you know, from the sort of post-war period onwards. Um, previously, it had a big herring fishing industry. But when that died out uh, in uh, in the late uh, the late 1800s, um, the, the, you know, this was the whiskey distilling was the economy of this mm. town. And when as the other distilleries fell away and only two remained, you know, Springbank was pivotal to allowing this community to continue to exist. And, and today it has a huge number of employees. I don't know the exact number of them, but many, you know, they employ far more people for one distillery than I think, I think maybe Brookladdy on Isla could rival them. But there's, there are very few distilleries that now employ a large number of people to run one site, enabled by the fact that these decisions were taken uh, and maintained by the, the, the late owner, Mr. Headley Wright, to keep the whole production process there. Yeah. So running a malting floor mm -hmm. takes people. You have to turn the malt by hand. You to run a distillery, you need you need a few people. To maintain your warehousing, you need people. For running a bottling line, you actually need quite a lot of people. 
to make sure the bottles don't back up and fall off yeah. and check the labels and quality mm. control. And then there's also the tourism aspect as yeah. well. So there are tours that are given um, and, there, and there's also a shop uh, that's linked to Springbank as yeah. well. well. It's an interesting parallel with John Lobb just in terms of the importance of some of these firms in terms of you know conservation or preservation of the industry itself, right? By employing a large number of people, you ensure the continuity of the industry in and of itself, right? And maintaining that culture and you look at the British heritage firms, I mean, they're just as much a part of uh, British culture, you know, even though they're commercial, as, you know, many of the iconic kind of tourist sites, you know, in and around London. Uh, framework or that approach of multi-generational custodianship versus profit maximization is what allows that to persist. And, you know, it's not to be lost that, you know, the entire industry is beneficiaries of that uh, philosophy of running a business, you know, even the larger kind of conglomerates benefit from the fact that you've got firms like Springbank or John Lobb or Henry Poole uh, that are really committed to the training and preservation of, you know, that, if you will, cultural seed stock. Exactly. And I mean, and very seriously, there are practices that have been maintained by Springbank that distillers, sort of good distilleries owned by big companies, are now returning to. So um, very famously, I mentioned Yamazaki earlier mm -hmm. in Japan, uh, the company that owns that Centauri is, um, has a very admirable uh, view on the whiskey production process. And they are obsessed with traditional Scotch whiskey production processes to the point where they have been doing uh, floor malting at Yamazaki. They have direct firing at Yamazaki. Uh, now that they own a number of distilleries in Scotland, they've actually been implementing these production practices back into back some into of their uh, their distilleries that had previously been modernized and yeah. improved. Yeah. And they're now sort of going back to the future, <laughs> if you will, to find modern ways of interpreting traditional production practices. So uh, I, anybody that follows me on social media will know that I uh, have been at a distillery in, uh, in the Highlands in Aberdeenshire called Glengarry quite mm -hmm. a bit recently. And that distillery is owned by Centauri and very famously has actually had direct firing on its wash still reintroduced. Really? And they've also reintroduced floor malting at mm. Glengarry. So there is really a, it, this isn't just for marketing, like this is because there is a belief within that company that these traditional practices are key to creating complex spirits that have long maturation potential and that are going to safeguard the future of those distilleries by making a spirit that is distinctive, complex, well-rounded, and, and has the ability to be aged to a high age statement. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting how the internet has really uh, helped enable a connoisseurship, right, of the craft by allowing these nuanced you know, uh, you know, distilling techniques or shoemaking, whatever the craft is, these nuanced techniques that you wouldn't ever be able to describe on a label or on a box. Uh, even with your magazine, you know, Whiskey Magazine, you know, being able to tell those stories are what captivate the imaginations and uh, help, you know, build the allure of these traditional practices. You know, we do so much with shoemaking and suit making. You know, the handwork uh, doesn't exist for the sake of the handwork alone. It's not embellishment. There's actually a functional purpose and value behind it. And it's it's interesting how, you know, those principles in many ways are um, are fundamental truths that exist across the entire spectrum of craft. And when they're celebrated and encouraged, you know, we see this uh, increase uh, in the quality of the product that isn't done through technology, it's done through going back to the basics. I completely agree. And I think that really, and this applies to any uh, tailored or bespoke product or heavily handcrafted product, that they also, the best makers don't follow fads, right? They have their way of doing things, they have their techniques, and they, the reason they're famous is because they've stuck to their guns, right? And yeah. they, they might make the odd tweak to, to, to make sure that something is contemporary or suited to the customers of the time, mm -hmm. but really there are sort of core values of production that are maintained uh, rather than sort of chasing market insight uh, and saying, okay, well, you know, particular lapel shape is particularly very popular right now, we're gonna chase that right mm -hmm. now. You talk about sometimes, I know in London, uh, people talk about being able to, if you really know your suits, you can look at somebody and, and have maybe take a guess at which Savile Row tailor they've gone to.
Similarly, with uh, with very distinctive spirit characters, you know, you could do a blind tasting, and there are certain distilleries that have such a distinct flavour that might not necessarily appeal to everyone, but they have a distinct flavour that the moment you taste it, you go, "I know what that is." Hmm. Interesting. So now we move on to our third whiskey, uh, and we're actually moving to the, a heavily peated whiskey. Uh, this is Kohoman 100% Isla. This is the thirteenth edition. This is a distillery that I am personally a huge fan of. I mean, I'm a, I'm a fan of all three of these, and as I'm sure you can tell from the way I've spoken about them, but, but this distillery, I think, is the proof that actually you don't need 200 years of history to still embody these principles of, of handcrafting that we've been talking about. So this is a distillery that is, that is family owned as well. It was started on the Isle of Isla, just off uh, Scotland's west coast, the home of peated or the spiritual home of peated whiskey. It was started by the Wills family in the early 2000s. And from the very beginning, they wanted to pursue this philosophy of this 100% Isla production. Now, um, Isla has uh, an interesting climate. It has, uh, it's very windy. It's very changeable. Uh, it's not necessarily the place that you would necessarily want to grow barley in under normal circumstances. Mm -hmm. It's quite challenging to grow barley there. Okay. Um, there was uh, another distillery called Brookladdy. Uh, there was a gentleman who, who with his business partners, um, refounded that distillery with a similar outlook and focus on growing barley on Isla, a guy called Mark Rainier. And, and him, along with Kilhoman, have really pioneered bringing back barley uh, grown on Isla to whiskey production on the island. And was barley ever traditionally grown on Isla? So uh, my understanding is that it, it had been, there'd been some, there had been some growing there, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't really commercially yeah. uh, viable. It's quite, quite difficult to do. Mostly it's uh, sheep farming and, and cattle farming on, uh, on, on Isla. And, um, but, but the Wills family, very deliberately, when they founded this distillery, they wanted, they based themselves on a farm now, I think that's incredibly significant because at its heart and at its most fundamental level, whiskey is an agricultural product, right? So back in the mists of time, the reason people distilled grains was to create a product that had a long shelf life, that, that had high value, that could be traded over long distances without spoilage. Whereas like grain, when you, you have issues with storage long term, yeah. issues with controlling uh, moisture content, you might get mold if you're not managing it very, very carefully. By distilling it, you were sort of preserving the value of any surplus grain. So many distilleries historically were located on farms, and that's really where the traditions of whiskey sort of came from. Mm. So for them, they have gone back again and said, well, actually, we're going to take it a step further even than Springbank, and we're also going to have a farm. So they have a farm that covers a variety of landscape types across 2,300 acres. They have Aberdeen Angus cattle, they have black-faced sheep, and they grow barley there. Mm. So they're able to produce this product that uses only Isla barley. They also partner with some other farmers on the island to grow barley, and then they receive that barley, they floor malt it, just like we were discussing at Springbank, and then they distill it in uh, quite small stills. It allows them quite a lot of um, copper contact. And importantly, that barley that they're malting is heavily peated. Mm. So we're going to a smokier whiskey, but also one that is an expression of the terroir of this place, right? Because although it's not quite as linked to the land as, as winemaking, where if you take a grape variety and you grow it in five different places, the wines will taste completely different. Mm -hmm. There is an emerging body of academic research and evidence that supports the idea that actually barley grown in different places, if you process it correctly at the distillery, will have an influence on the flavor. And even, to be honest, even if that wasn't the case, I think this idea of saying we want something that is completely a product of our home yeah. is very admirable. Yeah, I mean, that's really beautiful. I mean, this idea of kind of single origin, you know, in an industry that traditionally would have been single origin, right? You wouldn't be, you know, trading barley as a commodity, you know, all the way from all parts over the island. And then allowing, you know, the distillation process to really articulate that, that nuanced, localized uh, characteristic. Again, I think of Habano cigar, which is single origin. Uh, you know, you compare this to any of the stuff that is drawing from ingredients all across the globe. It enables a very wide variety of flavors, but nothing that is uh, particularly distinctive to the land. And this, you know, is kind of like what 
you know, Habanos even is taking that to the next level, say, with the Partagas Maestra line, which instead of taking tobacco from Vuelta Abajo or from denominations of origin that Habanos uses, they're shrinking that to even a smaller uh, kind of geographical focus. Exactly. And I think that that's why, for me, if I, I always say to people that if you have an appreciation for the single origin and handcrafted nature of, uh, of a Cuban cigar, you're, you're going to find a lot of friends and a lot of familiar touch points in Scotch whiskey. Hmm. Interesting. Well, may so I do please, the honors? Do the honors. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very uh, excited to taste this because in my journey uh, with Scotch whiskey, uh, you know, I'd say the last phase before I transitioned to bourbon was uh, in Isla with the heavily peated whiskeys, which have an incredibly kind of nuanced and complex flavor that I found that when put to a single ice ball or ice cube, a large one, uh, produced an incredible cascade an evolution of flavors over the course of just one, you know, one pouring. I completely agree. And I think we've, we've touched on this before, this idea of dynamic flavor and a, a dynamic experience that evolves with time. And just as a cigar evolves as you move through the thirds, mm -hmm. a whiskey will, a really good whiskey will do the same. Wow. This is has a completely different nose uh, to the other two. I almost smell apple juice. Mm -hmm. I think there's some quite distinctive citrus notes in there. It's almost lemon peel. Mm. This has, I think of the three, probably the most, you know, dynamic nose. So we talked about the farming of the Wills family. So they have quite a substantial amount of land, but they only farm 220 acres of barley. So that means that there is actually a, a limited amount of their own barley that they're able to use for their products. And even on Isla, there is a, a limited amount of Isla barley production. So this is a this is a limited product, just like you know cigars that are made from the very best tobacco aren't something you can just completely scale up uh, forever. The same is true of these single origin whiskies. I mean, I would say that this, um, this is very balanced. I mean, these two together, uh, it's rounding out, you know, the blend of the Trinidad. Mm. Wow. I mean, it has a very complex, very sweet, very soft finish. And what's interesting is of the three of these, it has the least alcohol at the end of it. Smooth and soft all the way to the finish. And I'd say this best preserves the blend of, of, of this beautiful scar. Which is quite fantastic when you consider that on paper, many people might have said, well, a heavily peated whiskey or a, or a very smoky whiskey is maybe, you know, is that going to compete or clash with, with a cigar? Mm -hmm. And this is why I think it's so important to use this kind of methodology when you're trying to find perfect pairing, because actually trying to second guess it without doing the practical application is, is almost impossible. Yeah. I think it also points out the importance of being able to juxtapose certain uh, pairings against one another. I mean, tasting it in and of itself, you know, I'd say all three of these pair great, right? If I was to just have been drinking the Springbank or, or the Tamdu, I would have said, this is a beautiful pairing, I'm enjoying this. But in trying all three, we see how each interacts a little bit differently uh, with the cigar uh, that you wouldn't necessarily have picked up on if you didn't have something to compare it to. Exactly. And I think that's why it's so important when you're approaching a pairing and maybe you're going to be hosting a dinner uh, or an event and you want to find the, the perfect pairing for yourself and for your guests. I think it's so important to try a variety of styles. So whatever the kind of whiskey that yourself or, or your viewers enjoy, try to get that diversity of flavor and you're more likely to find something that is the optimal pairing for you. So for me, it's actually um, it's quite interesting when we when we went um, 
the other way. I was actually uh, noticing more of the um, delicate sort of berry fruit notes that are that I think are, are sort of a signature mm -hmm. part of the the Kilcoman style. I often talk about like very nice ripe blueberry being something that I get in very small mm -hmm. amounts of, in in this whiskey, and I think that interestingly, we're going this way that's dialed down and more of the vanilla notes um, from the American oak maturation have yeah. become more apparent for me. You know, it lingers on your palate, right? So versus taking an immediate puff right after you drink, you know, the whiskey, you know, allowing it to kind of sit on the palate and kind of, you know, working the palate really brings out that vanilla that you speak about, right? I mean, how it, you know, really sits on the palate, maybe it's the oils, whatever it is that's the residual uh, components, you know, when you work it with the saliva, it, you know, you almost reactivates. It, it keeps on giving. Yeah. <laughs> it's the gift that keeps on giving. And this is why we talk about a finish is such an integral part. When we assess whiskey, the finish is almost as it, well, it is, it's an equal part and as important as mm -hmm. the other stages, uh, the nose and the palate. The finish is also incredibly important. If you have a whiskey that smells wonderful, tastes okay, and then has no finish, we wouldn't mark that as highly as a whiskey that performs at all three stages. Yeah, it's amazing. So this whiskey in particular is also interesting because it's actually the product of three years of barley harvest, so 2012, 2013, and 2014, and it's been exclusively matured in ex-bourbon barrels. It's actually only 44 ex-bourbon barrels. So when we're talking about a small, small batch <laughs> product, I mean, this is, you know, that's a small number, uh, you know, a small, very small number of casks. You know, bigger distillers might consider a few hundred barrels to be a small batch product. Mm -hmm. So this really is a very considered special product. Uh, is it a single barrel that is then being bottled or is it being blended across multiple barrels you know, in multiple years? That's an excellent question. So one of the biggest misconceptions about single malt whiskey specifically is this idea that, oh, blending is something that's done for blended scotch. So when we're talking about blended scotch, we're talking about things like Johnny Walker, mm -hmm. Dewars, Buchanan's, Ballantines. These are called blended scotches, but the reason they're called that is because they're the product of many different distilleries and also two categories of whiskey, malt whiskey and grain whiskey. So when people hear blend, they think of those products, but actually blending is integral to production of most single malt whiskies as well. So there is a category called single cask single malt, mm -hmm. and that's when it is the product of only one barrel or one cask mm -hmm. and that, that has been bottled. But most of the time, what a producer will do is they will say, okay, well, how many bottles are we trying to create? Or what is the vision? What's the taste vision we're trying to create? Mm -hmm. They will look at their portfolio of maturing stock. They will assess those barrels and then they will work out okay well which ones are we going to use in what proportions to create the best product possible mm -hmm. and that i would imagine also just like with non-vintage champagne it's also what allows them to produce consistency year over year with you know this is i guess the 13th edition so it would uh, you know still be maybe kind of nailed to the year or associated with the year uh, but between the additions, would one expect consistency in what this is tasting like? So, with these two products, these have uh, these don't have a edition number yeah. or a batch number on or a year so, or a year exactly. I mean, so, they have an age, right? But exactly. Not an annual year. Exactly, and the age that you see on these two that is the age of the youngest whiskey in the blend. Mm -hmm. So there may be whiskey in this tamdu. In fact, I you can actually taste it because whiskey, when it goes past 20 years old, starts to take on flavors that you don't really find in younger whiskey. And I think personally, I can taste quite a bit of older whiskey in this tamdu. The same will be true of the Springbank. There might be some 11, 12 or 13 year old whiskey in here. This one, the, the Kilhoman 100% Isla 13th edition, actually has, uh, the average age is around eight years, but there will be um, there will be some younger, there will be some older. Well, there wouldn't be product. younger, well, average age. It, that's, that's the average yeah. age. This, this whiskey doesn't actually carry an age statement, okay. and that's why they only talk about the mm -hmm. average age. So now that we've tasted through these three very different whiskeys and enjoyed this fantastic Trinidad cigar, which one do you think is the perfect pairing for you? You know, for me, I think it's the Kilhoman. I mean, this one, you know, really stood out for me in terms of uh, the nuance, right? The delicacy, uh, the complexity, uh, and how uh, it really married beautifully with this Trinidad cigar. I mean, medium uh, bodied blend, you know, really needing something that wasn't going to overpower it. Uh, and this was uh, absolutely uh, gorgeous. And the two of them together made each better uh, 
with this specific cigar, I agree, it's a fantastic pairing. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting study just in luxury, right? And I think that, you know, the luxury that we're focused on, right, which is different than highly commercial luxury of, you know, the big kind of conglomerate fashion brands, you know, really, and you see this in a Habano cigar, it comes down to the people, right? And how they take their passion uh, and really their lives, right, that they've dedicated to a particular craft. It's the human story that you've told me behind these brands. And then like uh, this last one right here, you have that element of the land, the terroir, where there's just something unique about it that can't be reproduced anywhere else, uh, really in the world, and people have tried, uh, that the confluence of those three elements together creates something like we spoke about earlier with the pairings, uh, where the sum is greater than the parts. I completely agree. And just as we would say that any enthusiast of, uh, of Cuban cigars has to visit Cuba, I would say that taking a visit to Scotland to visit these distilleries is a pilgrimage for whiskey enthusiasts and one that I encourage everyone to do at least once in their life. Because until you have visited these distilleries and got a feel for the place, spoken to the people, understood how they live their lives, understood the cultural and historical context in which these distilleries were born. I think, I mean, you can enjoy these whiskies without having done yeah. that, right? They're delicious. But once you've done that, every time you pick up the glass, you're going to remember the people you met, the views you saw, the, the feeling of being at the distillery, the sounds of the distillery running. If you stand over the, the fermentation vessels or next to the mash tun, or you stand on the malting floors or in the still house when the heart of the run is being, is being collected, there are aromas there that you're going to then recognize in the whiskies mm. wherever you're tasting them around the world. Never had the privilege of uh, traveling uh, to Scotland to visit the distilleries, uh, but to experience that in situ, right, to be in that environment, uh, and then to have those stories told uh, is something that uh, really heightens and deepens connoisseurship. Ultimately, I think that is something that we all share in common, which is that connoisseurship. And those virtues of connoisseurship, um, you know, are universal, uh, and it's what allows one to appreciate Cuban cigars, it's what allows one to appreciate uh, scotch whiskey, it's what allows one to appreciate bourbon or wine, uh, and you know, each have their own story to tell. I've also, like yourself, dedicated my life to telling the stories of these people and of these whiskies, and uh, I can't think of anything else I'd rather do. Yeah. Well, and you're doing that now? You have a YouTube channel? We do. So, um, at Whiskey Magazine on uh, on YouTube. Um, I also have my own personal social media. I'm, I'm Quercus Alba on Instagram. It's actually a term that means American White Oak, the Latin name of American White really? Oak, the principal type of oak used for maturing whiskey. So, mm -hmm. at the time I started that account, I thought it was very clever, yeah. <laughs> but actually it's makes it very difficult for people to find me. But if you put in Christopher Coates, you can uh, you can look me up, see the, see the journeys that I go on. I tend to be visiting at least one distillery a month, um, and they can be anywhere in the world. So right now I'm here with you in Dallas because we've been up uh, near the border, uh, up in the north in Denison, visiting a, an American craft distillery called Iron Root Republic. Uh, we've also been visiting different distilleries in Scotland. We've actually just finished a series about the history of blended scotch. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the very first project I worked on, which is still incredible, incredibly close to my heart was a documentary about the life of a gentleman called um, Dennis Malcolm, uh, OBE, who um, Dennis was born on the site of the Glen Grant distillery and worked there, uh, has worked there for over 60 years. Wow. So, I mean, there, these, you were talking about the personal stories. Yeah. Scotch whiskey is absolutely full of them. And I would love to share some of these stories with you on a future visit to Scotland. Yeah. Well, Chris, there it is. It's on film, so we must do it. We're committed. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your passion with us today. A good friend of mine once said, the greatest luxury of all is sharing one's passions with others. Thank you for doing that today. Uh, this was brilliant. And uh, what an incredible pairing we've enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you.